one microphone, a guitar, and a platinum record. This is the story of Bon Iver and the meteoric rise of his album For Emma Forever Ago. It's also a story of how the right music will transcend any limitations. Now there's a lot of story behind this song and a lot of story behind the album For Emma Forever Ago. And if you're watching this video, it is probably a story that you can really, really relate to. With a single Shore SM57 and a few $200 department store guitars from Sears from like the 1960s, Forema Forever Ago was certified platinum. And Skinny Love became the anthem that opened the floodgates for the entire indie folk movement. Never be my, 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 my. At the blood for Mumford and Sons, Solf Jan Stevens, Fleet Foxes, or, or Phoebe Bridgers, everyone has a little respect that they have to pay to this album for what it did to the musical landscape. And it started with less equipment than you probably have on your desk right now. Probably. So let's go over it. Let's take a look at the production behind these tracks and see what's going on. Why are these tracks so heart-wrenching? And what techniques can we steal and then use for ourselves? First, the story. Justin Vernon was only 25 at the time of recording this album. He was moving back home to Wisconsin after a 10-year stint with his band in North Carolina. The band had just kicked him out, he had pneumonia, he was newly heartbroken after a recent breakup, and he was addicted to online gambling. The record kind of started in my head. I was living in North Carolina, and uh, I was living, I was really homesick, and uh, I was also really sick. I had like a liver infection and uh, pneumonia and all this stuff. And uh, I think I think what was going through my head at the time was, was some very stirring things, things that have been kind of building up in my life for a really, really long time. Vernon was in a rough place to say the least. Broken down, he decided to retreat into social isolation. The plan was to spend three weeks in a remote hunting cabin in the middle of the Wisconsin wilderness. He lived off of beer, eggs, cheese, and whatever he could hunt in the woods. Apparently that was too dear what he ended up hunting. Three weeks soon turned into three months. He chopped wood, he cleaned the brush off of the property, he even had an encounter with a bear who tried to get into his house. Eventually, having grown tired of his quote, self-indulgent lazy lifestyle, he dragged his musical equipment out of the car and decided to work on some songs that he had been writing prior to coming to the cabin. The gear was really just a few cheap, old guitars, a Shure SM57, and a cheaper version of Pro Tools called Pro Tools LE. When I was sick, I was just like in bed for three months and I, I was on eBay and I found this and I started emailing with the, the lady that sold it to me. She was from Texas and I guess it was like her husband's and it's like a 60s Sears like catalog guitar. I, I played it and it was just like, that's amazing <laughs> and from there almost every song on the record uh was made with it um like you can kind of hear how it's really brittle and, and things like that and i just put the microphone as close to the the f hole here as possible and it just got like a really like creaky really close kind of woody sound now these pieces that vernon was working on were notably very different from the prior works that he had been working on with his old band focusing particularly on the use of falsetto vocals oftentimes they would start completely devoid of lyrics and be completely melody first and this tapped into something that was just a little bit less literal we'll get back to this in a minute when the wisconsin winters passed vernon emerged with nine demos or so he thought it was a solid start to what would hopefully become his future album but then here why, why don't you just take a listen i what didn't know it was a record i was kind of thinking this is this is a good step in the right direction maybe this is demos maybe this is i didn't know i i wasn't even thinking of even getting it on a record label or anything at that point uh but I definitely, you know, I was playing it for my friends and I was definitely getting kind of feedback that felt different than any other kind of feedback I'd gotten prior to that. And so when, when I got that kind of feedback, I just decided, you know, all right, let's take a shot with this. So I sent it out to a few labels. And I handed it to a, 
a few friends and it, it just really didn't take long. It just sort of happened, you know, it just like went. Something about those demos, the rawness of them, the roughness of them, really connected with people. And it really wasn't long before major attention skyrocketed the album to be one of the best debut albums of the 2000s, if not the best. It hit the top 100 charts in the UK. It was featured on Grey's Anatomy. And as of 2020, For Emma Forever Ago has been featured in the top 500 albums of all time, according to Rolling Stone. All of this with less gear than you probably have yourself. It's a classic tale of artist over production, and even further, using the lack of tools as a tool. In the classic words of Bosco Man, shitty is still pretty. Here, take a look. In this classic production essay, Bosco Man says this, please forget everything you learned about how professional recordings are made and come raw with it. I guarantee you can get a better drum sound from a $20 Radio Shack mic in your garage than you can ever get with a $5,000 U47 in a $300 per hour professional studio. Why do you think all these millionaire rappers sample beats instead of recording them? Gritty, low fidelity recordings are real, they're honest, and they're very emotionally powerful. You can use that. So one of Bon Iver's most powerful production techniques on this record is his use of vocal layering. And more specifically, layering falsetto vocals. I'm down on my own. I'm building a still to slow down the tide. But this is a specific kind of vocal recording that takes advantage of the higher register. Layering and conglomerating multiple parts on top of each other is also nothing new. But by spreading these unique airy vocals around the stereo image, the top of the mix has a massive amount of high-end presence that provides a delicate choir-like halo around the entire album. In a way, the album kind of lacks a lead vocal. Instead, kind of led by an entire choir of vocal tape. And even further, by layering these vocal takes on top of each other one by one, imperfections begin to complement one another. The hugeness that you would get from like a $5,000 studio condenser microphone in a professional recording environment have been replaced by an army of smaller, thinner vocal takes. Take a listen to the track Flume and notice the lack of high end, also the thinness of the guitar, and finally, how the vocals morph together into a ghostly collective. All too commonly, we think of production as a polishing act, cleaning up the song to be perfect. The clearest, hugest vocals with the widest, most powerful guitars. And sure, there is a time and place where that's called for. But remember, production is an extension of the songwriting, a tool to inf- The f was that? A tool to imp- a t It's a tool. Threw me off. It's a tool to emphasize the feelings that you're trying to convey in your music. It is not a race to the perfect mix. The perfect mix doesn't exist. Going into the writing of this album, Vernon was a broken man, and that shows in the songwriting. And further, that shows in the production. The guitar is thin and distant and ghostly at times, and many people would consider it to be recorded improperly. The vocals are brittle and broken, but there are many of them. We could analyze this all day. Dozens of howling vocal takes all conglomerating together. A sense of togetherness through this sort of shared pain. I, I literally just made that up, but a perfect vocal take doesn't make you think that way. An imperfect one does. So let's talk a little bit about the instrumentation here. Listen to Skinny Love, but pay attention to the guitar and pay attention to the taps and the clicks and the pops that are making up the percussion.
Now, Vernon used a unique style of guitar and a unique mic position to get the tone that he did. He had an old 1960s Sears guitar. You used to be able to buy them from like an old catalog. Now, they're really not that great of instruments, but they've become kind of renowned for that thin, bright tone. It's very unique. Now, the SM57 is a dynamic microphone, which means we typically have to mic the instrument a lot closer. Now, Vernon pretty much put that SM57 almost inside of that old guitar. I would assume to try and salvage as much low end from the guitar as possible. Still pretty thin though. I don't have that style of guitar and odds are you don't either, but we can try and replicate that same tone using a standard acoustic. And the way we do that is with mic position. Now check out Skinny Love for a second and listen closely to the stereo spread of the guitars. Listen for the left guitar and the right guitar and hear how they slightly differ in both rhythm rhythm and tone. So we're going to try and emulate that same exact thing by picking out two different mic positions on the guitar, which will have two different tones, and panning one to the left and one to the right. Now this mic position that you're seeing right now, I'm kind of considering the main position. It has more low end than the other position, so it will have a bit more body and will carry the majority of the tone. Here's what it sounds like. Worth noting that you can get more brightness out of your guitar by actually changing where you pick. If you pick closer to the bridge, you're gonna get a brighter tone. Now the other position that we used is a lot different and a lot more unique and a little bit more niche. We found this position by essentially moving the microphone around to different parts of the guitar that are avoiding the sound hole. The sound hole is where you get most of your low end. So by putting the microphone way up here on the neck and making sure to mic it closely because it's still a dynamic microphone, we can get more brightness without the body and we're gonna get more string noise, more pick noise, things like that. Here's what that tone sounded like. So when we sum these two tones together, we get a pretty nuanced sort of tone that is different on the left side than the right side. These guitars kind of rock in and out of time in a sort of unstable fashion. This could be considered a fault, or we can use that to our advantage in the production. This creates a pretty interesting and dynamic texture as we move through the track. Don't just consider the perfect take to be completely devoid of any issue and in turn, any uniqueness. Vernon came to this album a pretty broken dude. Life put him through the ringer and he went to this cabin to go recover. And that process of recovery, that's really what gave birth to this record. And uh, that was the first time I sort of realized that I had I had accomplished something, that I had made something, I had made this record, but I, just as importantly to me is that I had kind of refound myself or, or at least carved out another path to live and, and, and healed some wounds that I'd probably just neglected for too long. Everything else about the production is constructed to serve the human element to these tracks. Production is not just polish. Production can be polish, but production can also be patina. It's really just doing whatever you need to do to craft the framework of the song to further emphasize the message that you're trying to convey. Forima Forever Ago probably would not have been a success if it was recorded on a $5,000 microphone and in the vacuum of a professional studio. It needed to be born out of a place of isolation it needed to be born in a darker environment. And it needed equipment that captured that environment in a more vulnerable state. Well, there's a good chance that you've got equipment like that. There's a good chance you have an environment like that. So 
maybe you should go work on that platinum album yourself because I know that you've got it in there somewhere too. See you later.